other mic. Okay, great. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the South Orange Library's lecture series, Special Conversations. I'm Laura Sims, the moderator, and I am so pleased today to have Michael Barakiva with us. I wanted to check with you, is that per the correct pronunciation? You know, there's some scholarly debate about that. It's originally, <laughs> um, it's the Israeli side of the family, so it's originally okay. Bar hyphen Akiva, which would be Bar Akiva, but then we, it's sort of been Americanized to Bar Akiva. Bar Akiva, okay. Sure. I kind of did like halfway in between. I liked it. No, you gave it some great flair. <laughs> That's great. Um, but I'm so excited to have Michael here with us today for a Pride Month slash summer reading conversation about his novels and also about his other creative work. Um, Michael is an Armenian slash Israeli American theater director and writer who lives in Hell's Kitchen, NYC with his husband. His first novel, One Man Guy, wonderful novel published by FSG, was ranked the number one gay young adult novel on Goodreads in 2014, was named to the Rainbow List and Family Equality Council's Book Nook, and was released in Brazil by Leia. Also don't know if I'm saying that right, but. Sure, me neither. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the standalone sequel, Hold My Hand, also an, an amazing book, um, was released in May 2019. He's currently working on his third novel, which you see behind him on the wall, um, a queer protagonist contemporary epic fantasy, which I can't wait to talk to you about that as well, entitled These Precious Stones, also with FSG, FSG to be released in the winter of 2024. So welcome, Michael. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. Yeah, thank you for joining us. It's great to have you. And I think we talked about you starting by reading from one of your novels or both. Yeah, you know, I'm going to do two little excerpts from Hold My Hand because okay. One Man Guy did very well, unlike Hold My Hand. And I, I'm quite fond of Hold My Hand. Um, I am too. Uh, yeah, I did. So, so I thought, you know, I've done a bunch of events for, around One Man Guy, but I thought, you know what? I'm going to give this book its due. Good, good. Please do. Great. So I'm going to read two excerpts. The first is the opening excerpt, which is, um, um, I guess I'll talk about it a little bit. It's a... Um, when I started writing this book, I had this idea to start out with this making out scene between the two boys. And my publisher was a little worried about st starting with something so racy. Mm -hmm. So we did three or four other iterations and none of them were good. Mm -hmm. And then the person uh, and the publishing side who was most nervous about it left for another job. And so we just decided, you know what? Why not just start it with the scene? And so- I love that. <laughs> this talk is titled, you know, um, Queer Love Scenes and it's Pride Month. I thought this would be a nice one to start with. And then if people aren't bored, I'll read another section from later on in the book. Perfect. Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kissing Ethan. Kissing Ethan rocked. Kissing Ethan was like taking a rocket to outer space, floating in zero gravity, and marveling at the incomprehensible beauty of the creations of the universe. Kissing Ethan was sweet like the last piece of baklava drenched in honey snapped from the bottom of the box. Kissing Ethan was the answer to an unasked prayer. And then there was being kissed by Ethan. Being kissed by Ethan was not the same as kissing him. Being kissed by Ethan was rapture, surrender, being kissed was surfing a wave of joy, unpredictable and uncontrollable, that could break any moment and send you tumbling, an endless series of surprises. Being kissed by Ethan was endorphins kicking in two hours into a tennis match, transforming pain into euphoria. It was being a ship in a violent storm, hoping you wouldn't be torn apart as the ocean churned beneath you. It was feeling like your skin, your very body, would explode because it couldn't possibly contain all the joy pulsing through it. Alec brought Ethan's face back up to his own. He kissed Ethan back. Kissing Ethan was safer than being kissed by him. Whoa, 
Alec pulled away, gasping for air as if he just edged out a victory in the tiebreaker of a five-set tennis match full of baseline strokes, cross-court slams, and net game saves. Come on, Ethan purred. We're just getting started. Hundreds of half-naked men stared at Alec from the images Ethan had plastered around his room, cut from magazine ads, a kaleidoscope homage to homoeroticism. The effect was dizzying as well as wall and ceiling and floor merged seemingly endlessly with sculpted torsos and abs and chests and calves. I promised my mom I'd get, uh, I promised my mom I'd help get ready for Thanksgiving. Alec retrieved his bright purple shirt with plaid gray details from the chair by Ethan's desk, the only piece of furniture in the room other than the bed where Ethan remained. I hate to point out the obvious, but Thanksgiving isn't for another week, Ethan rolled over. Or is this some weird Ar Armenian thing like Christmas that you celebrate at a different time than everyone else in the whole freaking world? We Armenians celebrate Thanksgiving just like everyone else in this country, thank you very much. Although, did you know that Canadian Thanksgiving is celebrated on the second Monday in October? No, I did not know that. Ethan sat up, surrendering to Alex's departure. You're going to your grandmother's for Thanksgiving, is that right? That was the plan. Alec finished the last buttons on his shirt and grabbed his leather book bag, groaning under its nearing midterms weight. But then Nana twisted her ankle, so she decided she wasn't up to hosting Thanksgiving. I will try to spare you the political saga that ensued as my dad and his two siblings negotiated who'd assume the mantle, but suffice to say it involved three instances of blackmail, two of coercion, the re-emergence of a fight from 20 years ago when my dad and his older sister were in college that had something to do with a cat, tears, apologies, more tears, and a complicated negotiation involving a credenza that both my dad and his younger brother would like once Nana finally passes into the next world. We're talking backroom deals that would almost put 45 presidential administration to shame. And this is sparing me the saga? Alec nodded. The long and short of it is that we will be hosting Thanksgiving this year, so yes, seven days is barely enough time to prepare. My mom took the week off from the UN, the entire week, because she knows that hosting her in-laws is a prime opportunity for Nana to judge my mom's cooking, housekeeping, and child rearing. In fact, in one of the Sunday morning news shows theorized that Nana intentionally twisted her ankle just to have the opportunity to criticize whoever was fool enough to step up. Our Alec roll, Ethan rolled over on his back, defeated. Are all Armenian families this complicated? From what I hear at church, we're on the simpler side. My mom has six siblings who all live in the same town in Southern Cali. I'm amazed they haven't had a Romeo and Juliet style feud spring up there. Alec finished tying his shoes. I'll see you soon, okay? Wilt thou leave me so unsatisfied? Ethan asked, eyes batting innocence from the bed. What satisfaction canst thou expect? Alec flirted back. See, I can quote Romeo and Juliet too, but I'm still out of here. Ethan hopped out of bed and threw on a plaid flannel that hung open on his wiry frame. He kissed his boyfriend goodbye. I'll see you later, okay? That's the opening scene. I love it. I love how you managed to do not just a steamy scene, but also really give us a taste for Alec's family in that, you know, and the family is such an important character. You know, it's not just a backdrop. Like it, his family is like crucial to these, both of these books. Yeah, the, the Armenian stuff in my early drafts of the first book, um, I wasn't bold or uh, rude enough to use my own familial experience growing up and the family was the family scenes were so boring. And then once I infused it with some autobiographical experience, they really livened up. That's so funny. And do your family members recognize themselves sometimes in your pages? They, they do, but as I insist to all of them, they, all the characters fiction. are me. All fiction. <laughs> all <me. laughs> fiction is so useful that way. You yes, can always is. say, oh, it's just made up. What are you talking about? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, did it did it resonate for you how funny yes. oh that's interesting yeah. <laughs> that's great did you want to read another scene what do you think should i read another one i think i think so we have plenty of time great that's a short one so um this scene is um 
You know, the, the part of this book, interestingly, that has resonated, I think, for the most readers are a series of scenes that take place in Alex Church, uh, Armenian Orthodox Church. I wasn't raised Armenian Orthodox, so I had a lot of fun research to do on this. And there is a family story that I will tell, which is that when um, my mom moved, when my family moved to this country from Israel, the Armenian side, my um we started going to a Lutheran church for reasons nobody still quite understands why the son of a Jew and an Armenian Orthodox, how we ended up at a Lutheran church. And then, uh, you know, and I did the confirmation class and I decided I was agnostic and it was a very helpful education in the Bible, which is an important piece of literature. And then when my grandmother, the Armenian grandmother moved over maybe 10 years later, is that right? Maybe a little bit later, we suddenly all started going to this Armenian church as if we'd been going there the entire time. And it was a sort of hilarious piece of subterfuge that I'm sure everybody saw through. So I had this, um, these scenes are, were a question for me about how Alec, who is out and six, uh, 14, 15 years old, uh, engages with the Reverend Father of his church, who is an intelligent, considerate, person and uh who at this and who at the same time like many orthodox christians chooses to interpret the biblical stuff about homosexuality in a very conservative way and so it's it's these two you know i think very reasonable people who share a lot in common one a teenager and one an adult trying to find common ground and make sense of things while at the same time being authentic to themselves. So, um, so, um, so, what what is the backstory here? You know, at his Sunday at his Sunday school class, he's outed, or there somebody uses an, uh, uh, you know a sort of a rude epithet about homosexuality, and the Reverend Father comes and speaks to the class about it, and Alec is not satisfied with the way that it is addressed. So he decides to engage the Reverend Father after a Sunday service in the next week. I guess that's the backstory that we need. Okay. So um, Alec is waiting for everybody to leave. And when they all leave, he says, I was wondering if I could talk to you about something for a moment. Of course. Reverend Father Stepanian put on one of his strong, what put one of his strong solid hands on Alec's shoulder and led him to a pew inside the sanctuary. What can I help you with? It's about when you came and spoke to our Saturday school class yesterday, Reverend Father. Ah, yes. I wanted to thank you for telling the Yeretzken about that incident. I'm so glad you brought it to my attention. It would have been easy to leave it at that, to have accepted a compliment from this figure he'd admired his entire life. But as Reverend Father Stepanyan turned to go, his robes rustling with the movement, Alec found his voice. I really appreciate you coming and talking to the class about what happened, but I'm not sure you actually helped. The Reverend Father turned back regarding Alec. Is that so? He sat back down. What would you have done differently? When you use phrases like people who've lost their path from God, you're actually encouraging bullying. You're telling people it's all right to treat them differently. But Alec, you must know the church's view on homosexuality. Come on, Reverend Father. We live in the 21st century. Gay marriage is legal in every state in this country, as well as Canada, Brazil, New Zealand, Ireland, Chile, Germany, and Mexico. You don't really believe that nonsense, do you? Alec immediately wondered if he'd taken things too far. But the Reverend didn't seem upset, just reflected. It was something Alec had always admired about him, the amount of time he took before speaking. After a few more moments of deliberation, the Reverend Father said, as a pastor in this church and the Reverend Father of this congregation, it is my duty to shepherd the spiritual lives, lives of my flock. So you're saying that you agree with the church's position? Alec, you want a simple answer here, but sometimes the truth lies in the space between more complex things. And sometimes it doesn't. Alec's exasperation found its way into his voice. Have you or anyone in the whole church for that matter ever thought about what it might be like for someone who doesn't subscribe to these heteronormative standards to be part of this congregation? Alec hadn't meant to out himself to the Reverend Father, but as the words came tumbling out of his mouth, they both realized that he had done so. Oh, I see. Reverend Father Stepanian exhaled gently as he realized what Alec was telling him. 
I see, he repeated, without judgment. So what? Now you think I'm a bad Armenian? Alec pressed. How long has your family been coming to St. Stephen's? I'm not sure since before my brother was born. So almost 20 years, at least. I remember baptizing you. You were a very good baby, no crying at all. Unlike your older brother, Andronik. He made such a fuss, you should have heard him screaming at the top of his lungs. I've known you your whole life. And I know you are a good boy, Alec, and a good Armenian. Learning this isn't going to change anything. Thank you, Father. Alec leaned back in the pew and realized and released the breath he hadn't been aware he was holding. The world has changed in many ways since you were born, mostly for the good, I'm happy to say. But the church takes a long time to catch up. And that's why I ask you to understand my position. I adore your family, even though I know that I can count on you to be at least 20 minutes late. The Reverend and Alex shared a smile. After service, your mother's dolma is always the best at the buffet. My father's dolma, you mean, Alec corrected him. Excuse me? My father makes the dolma in our house. The Reverend's father smiled, sheepishly running his hand over his immaculately trimmed beard, which showed the slightest signs of graying. My apologies. I suppose it was foolish of me to make that assumption. We learn so much about ourselves by the things we take for granted, don't we? He started again. Your family's dolma is always the best, but the church is very clear about its doctrine. Homosexuality is a sin. Do you have any gay friends, Reverend Father? Of course I do. And do you believe in your heart of hearts that your gay friends can lead upstand upstanding lives, but when they get to heaven's gate, they will be denied entrance for being gay? If I died right now in some freaky alien invasion, would I go to hell? What I believe is not relevant here, Alec. The belief of the church is what's important. So your beliefs are different than the church's. The Reverend Father smiled. You're not going to trick me into an admission, Alec. We pastors wrestle with this all the time. But the church's position is that love and sex are special gifts from God to be enjoyed within the sacrament of marriage. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them uh, awry, for it is better to marry than to burn. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 8 to 9. All sex outside of marriage is considered the sin of fornication. So if Ethan and I got married, everything would be all right. Sadness crept over the reverend's faith. I'm afraid not. Romans chapter 1, verses 21, 22, 26, and 27 make it very clear that the special gift of love and marriage is reserved for a man and woman. So does Leviticus. Leviticus also says not to eat shellfish or the fat from a goat, lamb, or sheep. And I'm sure I don't have to remind you about good old Leviticus' stand on mixed seeds or fabrics. Who gets to decide which passages in the Bible we have to take at face value and which ones we get to interpret? That's the whole point of church, at least the Armenian church, Alec. We priests have spent our lives studying the Bible. It's writing, it's interpretation, it's meaning, that's our job. From where I'm sitting, mixing fabrics is much more shocking than me having a boyfriend. Why, just last week, I saw your wife sporting a cashmere pashmina over a wool jacket, and I think her blouse was made of cotton. I prayed extra hard for her that night, Reverend Father. Father Stepanian laughed heartily. It's nice to talk to you like this and see how passionately you feel about it. The Reverend Father leaned in, confiding. To be honest, between you and me, I do think the church's view on some things could use updating, but it takes time, Alec, for a ship this size to change direction. You have to remember the Armenians were the first people to convert to Christianity, and it is my job to hold the church's beliefs. You know, a heretic is not someone who doesn't believe. He's someone who picks and chooses which doctrines he follows. True faith doesn't work that way. It's not a buffet that you can sample at will. You have to sign up for the whole deal. So single fabric outfits from now on, Alec asked. The Reverend Father laughed again. From now on, for simplicity's sake, let's make it easy, okay? Just keep your personal life personal. I will think about this conversation, Alec, and I hope you do too. He got up to leave. And happy birthday, Alec. The big one five. I consider our congregation very lucky to have such an intelligent young man speaking at our service on Christmas Eve. Mrs. Stepanian shared your winning essay with me and I can't wait for you to share it with the whole congregation. The germ of an idea began sprouting in Alec's mind. Neither can I, Reverend Father, neither can I. And that's that. That's wonderful. I love that scene. I love it. And I remember that Alec is spurred to this conversation when the Reverend Father 
defends him right to the bullies or to to he comes and speaks and says like this is wrong but he also says you know we have to have not pity but yeah, empathy, yeah. basically pity for those who are going to hell basically yeah, totally totally like, yeah you know, I do have pity for the people going to hell right you have that but I love I love that scene that you just read because it's so complex. You know, no one is demonized. The, the Reverend Father is not, it is not a simple conversation. It's not a simple portrait of, of a religious figure. Um, it's really complicated and, and, and wonderful too. Thank you so much. I am, um, yeah, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, I think to myself all the time, like how, how can we have new conversations and I feel like you know the um Christianity has done so many horrible things in this world especially especially to queer people but the conversation with a reasonable and rational mm. religious figure felt like the, the more interesting conversation to have and one that could sustain the storyline of a of a book definitely definitely yeah I, I agree. And I, I love also how, you know, you've written this book that's very appealing and appealing teen romance, but it's also tackling these big issues, not only this, you know, the religious issues, but also like the Armenian genocide um, plays a huge role. Um, so how did you do that? How do you do both? How do you do it all? <laughs> well, you know, I, um, I was, I think like most teenagers who read, when I was a teenager, I thought about the big things. Like most teenagers, I think most teenagers think about the big things too. And, and I, one of the real surprises of these books, again, in the earlier drafts, when there wasn't Armenian stuff in it, the books were so bad. And then as I infused the Armenianness into the books, what I discovered is that there is a great intersectionality between my Armenian experience and my queer experience. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Mm -hmm. And so even though one is so personal and one is so uh, global, mm -hmm. the, 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 it, it just, I don't know, it happens sort of naturally. And also I think the great thing about being a teenager is that your own personal experience, I mean, this is still true of me as an adult, but your own personal experience is as profound as a global experience in that emotional landscape. Yes, right. Everything feels huge. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, before we go on, I just wanted to say that while I'm asking questions, if other people have questions, if you want to just type them in the chat and I'll get to them later, or you can just wait and raise your hand later, but um, feel free to type questions in the chat. Um, I was wondering, Michael, if you meant to write for younger for a younger audience or if it just kind of came out that way. You know, I am, um, I've never taken a writing class and I still don't really think of myself as a writer. So, you know, I trained as a theater director. I did my graduate work in directing and that's how I've made, you know, my livelihood um, directing plays and now running theaters. And so when uh, a friend of mine from college who became an editor, our mutual friend, Joey Peskin, when she said, you know, I, we were at a mutual friend's birthday party around the time I turned 30 and she said oh you should write a gay young adult novel that is a really up-and-coming genre and I said oh okay <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> sure yeah why not and we worked on it for a while and that was the first draft that I have mentioned earlier that had no Armenianism and was very bad <laughs> and we tried to sell it and nobody wanted it and so it just sort of you know went where all unpublished manuscripts go to that special limbo purgatory right and then years later, when she uh, moved to FSG, she got in, in touch with me and said, you know, I, I always thought there was a good book there. And do you want to look at your manuscript? I didn't even have a copy of it. It had been a few years and I had survived a few computer crashes. And, you know, I was not somebody who backed things up. Yeah. So she sent it to me and I was like, oh, this is really bad. No wonder nobody <laughs> wanted to buy it. But I, I like enough, enough time had passed that I could look at it as if somebody else had written it. 
And then I was merciless with the um, rewriting of it. So we rewrote it and then we sold it and to FSG. And I'm so grateful to have a publishing house. You know, all three of my books will be with them. And uh, Great. yeah, yeah, I feel really lucky. And yeah, and it's rare for an editor to be so involved, like from the start, you know, in today's publishing industry, that's usually a role that an agent, you know, yeah. some agents fill, but that's really special that Joy was, was that involved, like basically told you, write a gay young adult novel. <laughs> totally, and read every, you know, every few months I'd send her some pages and she read them and nothing had been wow. sold. And then the same thing was true with um, Hold My Hand. You know, I had the scene in the middle of the book, which I'm too embarrassed to read. I thought about reading it today, but I'm too embarrassed, which is sort of these two boys trying to figure out how to have sex for the first time. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I knew that was the heart of the book. Right. And, um, and at first it was the first chapter and then it was the end. And then, but you know, Joy was really instrumental in both of those books. And in my next book, These Precious Stones, um, Joy doesn't really edit genre. So she handed me off to Trisha de Guzman, who is also at FSG. And she has been the same way. You know, every 50, 75 pages, I send them over to her. She gives me invaluable feedback and we talk about how to move forward. And I don't think I am a confident or a confident enough writer to work without somebody who's going to be shepherding me that way. Right, right. That's that's great though. It's it's a real collaboration. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I I do want to hear more about this fantasy novel. <laughs> what uh, made you want to write? And we'll go back to the to one man guy and hold hold my hand. But um what how did you go in that direction? So I'm like one of those kids who grew up on D and D and Star Wars and Star Trek and Lord of the Rings. Like I am a I am a genre geek. Yeah. And in the way that I started, my the first two books were sort of genre experiments. Like what it, what if I wrote about a gay, a, a YA gay rom com, but I didn't have the queerness be or the coming out be the central issue? Mm, right. And then what I just yeah, yeah. and then what I accepts him. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You know, the way that mine accepted me, and, you know, I acknowledge that there are many places in the country and the world where it is still very dangerous to be queer. But at the same time, the the violent coming out stories become a kind of pornography. And mm -hmm. I knew enough people who have had great coming out stories that it felt really important for me to represent those as well. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And I discovered in the writing of the books that they became about other things. I discovered that they were about intersectionality and, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. So I think with these precious stones, I was conscious growing up that queer representation in genre existed almost solely as the villains. Mm -hmm. And they are explicitly or implicitly queer. And, you know, I can use the stretch of Disney movies from my high school years as great examples that Little Mermaid has Ursula, who is literally inspired by a drag queen, literally. Right. And Beauty and the Beast has, um, what is that, that muscle queen, uh, the vain muscle queen, I forget his name right now. Um, oh, oh, right, uh, Gaston. Gaston, yeah, who's like so clearly this sort of like narcissist queer. Yes. Aladdin has Jafar, who is this queen sorcerer, you know, with the robes. Yeah. So I knew that I wanted to write in fantasy, it's contemporary fantasy. A lot of people in the book business I've discovered call this urban fantasy, but that feels crazy to me because it's not set in the city. So I will right. also be referring to it as contemporary fantasy. Yeah. So it's like in our world, like if there was magic, like Harry Potter, for example. But then in writing it, I discovered, I think two really fun things. The first is that you don't just change, you don't just add queerness to the protagonists of a genre like fantasy that uses the Campbell heroes myth. It, the, the queerness forces the myth to reorder itself around itself. Yeah. So that was really fun. And the second thing was that 
a lot of fantasy and science fiction doesn't have queer queerness represented in the villains, but it doesn't have any queerness. Yeah. And I can use Lord of the Rings as a great example. You know, mm -hmm. there is no queerness in Lord of the Rings, and I can use many contemporary authors also, but I won't. And when you are writing in a new world, a world that is not our world without our hangups and sexual anxieties, and you decide that everybody is white or everybody's male or everybody is cis or everybody's able-bodied or everybody is straight, the act of erasure is violent. Mm -hmm. And I go back and forth thinking to myself, what caused more damage for me was seeing the only queer representation as villain or having erasure be the experience of my genre loving teenage closet itself. Right. And in a lot of ways, that's what the book I think has been has it has been sort of inspired by is a desire. And specifically, you know, there's so much great YA fantasy out there right now with queer and trans and non-binary protagonists. But the thing that really gets me going is epic, is that mm -hmm. it is grand. It is that it is a big story with lots of characters and lots of world building. And that is the that is the thing that I really wanted to um, to create for young people, the thing that I wish I had when I was that age. Right. And will this be a multi-book story, do you think? Well, you know, it, hopefully, it is It is right now one very long book. <laughs> one, <laughs> one, it is actually twice the, the, the length, almost exactly, of either of my first books. Wow. Um, and, wow. and I had no intention of ever writing something this long in my entire life. I don't know if I will ever write something this long again in my entire life. <laughs> but I, I'm in an amazing place with it right now. I've had 20 beta readers, including my husband and my mother-in-law, both of whom are on this call. You know, I've had uh, 20 people read the current draft and fill out a Google survey and give me input. And I am incorporating that input into the current draft. And it's making me break out in a sweat just oh my God. having 20 readers. <laughs> well, you know, what I figured out about this, um, yeah. there's a podcast that I love called Writing Excuses. Mm. And uh, they talk about the importance of and how to use beta readers. And as a theater person, this made a lot of sense to me because I understand previews really well. Right. So, um, so, but I also understand it's really easy to get overwhelmed by feedback. Yeah. So I do it in a survey and I ask really specific questions for the things that I want input on. And then I leave a section where I say, tell me whatever you like about the book. But is there something about being able to contain it in a form yes. that- Very makes smart. Yes, palatable. It's digestible. Yeah. yeah. And you have certain questions that are you are wondering about like a certain number of questions. Yeah, there are there are things that I know are not working and I'm asking questions about those things. Okay. Well, that's very smart. I never thought of doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and did you use alpha or beta readers when you wrote the book? Yeah, I do, but I have a like I would say four or five tops. And I tell them, you know, when I get my responses, I just tell me three to five main things, like main issues. So I, because if I get over, like I learned in workshops, like I would just get overwhelmed and it yeah, would ruin yeah. whatever I was writing. But the way you're describing, like using the Google poll, that's very smart because you still have some control. Yes. And I also, I don't know if you have found this, but as a director, I know this stuff, like after a preview or a run, when I meet the artistic director for notes and they give me notes, I'm so vulnerable that I can't hear it. Right. So I just write it down. And then the next day I read them and I know, right. yeah, in the live conversation, I'm just, I'm so having it as a document, I read the document, I feel traumatized by whatever feedback is, even if it's really positive. Right. All of it is traumatizing. And then I think, oh, I can't do it anymore. I'm going to give up. Why am I friends with this person when they hate me? They hate my writing. And then and then I look at a few days later, I'm just like, oh no, it's mostly positive. They just don't understand these, you know, or like, I just need right, to. Do this. Right. It's true. That's so interesting since you come from the theater world, which is, I think, you know, a lot more collaborative and, you know, you have more input ongoing throughout the process that that probably helps you as a as a writer too. 
Yeah, I think so. And I think this is also one of the reasons that I work with my editors the way that I do. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that's so interesting, I just directed um, the, a workshop of a wonderful new play by Brooke Berman called Dearly Beloved at Theatre Works in Hartford. Mm -hmm. And I have found that when I'm a director, and a director to a playwright is very different than an editor to a novelist, but there is a lot of overlap. Right. Working with Joy and Trisha, these wonderful editors, has made me such a better collaborator for my playwrights. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, how has being a director influenced being a novelist and vice versa? And so that's, yeah. Yeah, that's one huge way. Yeah, 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 that, that is huge. And, and I think that both, both of the editors that I've worked with have been so good about not telling me what they think the story should be, but getting me to understand what I think the story should be and the places where I am telling that story successfully and not, and how to change the latter into the former. Right. That's great. And that's that's the ideal, you know, role for an editor to play, yeah. right? Is to and get... I think what I was not doing ideally as a director to many of the new writers that I was working with, I was like, oh, it's so easy. Just write a scene like this, change it over there. You know, it's like so horrible and prescriptive. And then, <laughs> um, and then also I think that being a theater person, I always... <clears throat> about the chapters as scenes. Right. Yeah. So the narrative is excruciatingly difficult for me to write, but the dialogue is super fun. Right. I can tell. I can, I mean, I'm not, I can I can't tell that the narrative is excruciating, but I can tell yeah. that the dialogue is fun because it's so lively and wonderful. Like I love, I love Becky as a great oh, yeah. character and her relationship with Alec is so wonderful and their dialogue alone is like it's just amazing I love it yeah she was she's she's the best character and it's funny in the I have four <laughs> POV characters in the new book and hands down everybody's favorite is Alejandra who is a 17 year old you know young woman from Mexico City inspired by the extraordinary nieces on my husband's side of the family and everybody loves i mean she is hands <laughs> down She's favorite fan character. favorite yes and the oh, second yeah. fan favorite which is also fascinating is that there is a character in hold my hand a, a secondary character who i love who has a miserable ending in that book oh oh who I love, I love this character so much and I cannot believe how hateful I was to him in that book. And so he is a character in These Precious Stones. Oh, oh, that's and, cool. You've yeah, I, I felt a moral obligation to give him a better story. <laughs> that's really cool. That's really cool. And have you, do you feel like the, even though it's such a different genre, do you feel like writing these first two novels prepared you for doing the big fantasy novel. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, you know, there's like, <laughs> is that my feedback? I, I don't know. I think some people aren't muted. Maybe you have, can do you mute. have the power to mute them? Um, Michael, our producer does. Michael Pucci, yeah. if, if you're listening, Michael, if you could mute everybody. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, there we go. I am, um, yeah, you know, there's this element and I, I, I'm such a more confident theater director than I am young adult novelist, but there's just an element of craft, you know? Yes. And I started directing one acts and then I directed 60 minute plays and then I directed two hour plays and now I can direct longer plays. And I couldn't write a 550 page book when I started, I, you know, I, and, and at the same, so, so there was just a craft, but then at the right. same time, I think it has never occurred to me to write a short story. Right. Because I think, I, different it, yeah. The short story, very different. And I'm sort of big and messy. And what's nice about a book is that they are big and messy. And what's nice about an epic is that they are even bigger and even messier. So, so there's something about that that I quite love, actually. Mm -hmm. I find that whenever I start a short story, it just becomes a novel. 
<laughs> you know, it's like, I can't, I, I was a poet. So I did poetry for many years and then just started writing novels and you think, oh, a short story. But yeah, it's a different, it's so different. Such this, a form. The poetry is, the idea of writing poetry feels so intimidating to me because the one thing I know about it is that every word is so important. Right. And it's like, for me, it's like making a French sauce where you like saute and reduce and salt and you're just throwing away so much. You're like, it just feels so wasteful. I'm like, what about all those words in the garbage? You know? They're just words. <laughs> you can find new ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New better ones, right? <laughs> How did you make that transition from poetry to prose? Um, I don't know. I, I just, yeah, I did, like I said, I did poetry for many years. I published several, uh, poetry collections and that was like my identity for many years. And I always thought, oh, I want to write fiction sometime. And I never went on not doing it. And then right after I had my son, I sat down and I started writing, um, and I don't know, it just became the new vessel that I was putting that creative energy into. Like it didn't feel, even though it's very different, it didn't feel like such a huge divide, I guess, between, you know? Yeah. It, it taught me a lot about, poetry taught me, like you said, about, like I I'm write very spare novels. And I think poetry kind of trained me for that. Motherhood made me a prose writer. <laughs> I know it's very weird. It's like should have turned to writing very brief things, like oh, <laughs> did it backwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my friends who are mothers and writers say the, that uh, motherhood has. They, they say I used to have a ritual for writing, and now it's like I've got forty-five minutes and I write. <laughs> I know. I think that's the thing, and this is probably like what you were saying about how writing the novels teaches you craft right like you like I used to waste so much time in my 20s and 30s like yeah ritual whatever now just sit down and do it and that's yeah this oh. um, this book that you see um you know this book five of these precious stones that you see outlined behind me yeah is the one that I'm having the hard, hardest time with right now and all of my beta readers identify it as the the weakest book and the most boring book Although, interestingly, I think the problem that they identify in it is not what I believe the problem to be. Oh, interesting. They, yeah, this is the weakest book, and this is what I think we need to change about it. And I agree that it's the weakest book, but I have an idea about how to fix it that is different than what they are saying. But one of the things also is that in a book of this length, there are so many chapters and scenes that I wrote that are just not in the book right now. And that used to be terrifying to me, this idea of like the right. first draft and all, but up, nope, up, nope, that chapter, God, that Get chapter, later. God, don't need it. All those pages on board, exactly. cut, cut those pages. Exactly. You get used to it. Yeah. You get yeah. used to it. I have one question that popped up in the chat or it's, it's a comment, but it's James Cruz said, music plays an important role in the books. Um, thanks to Mr. Barakiva, I was introduced to Rufus Wainwright and my favorite, Brandy Clark. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know Brandy Clark except from well, know, reading in your book. So. Her most famous song is that she did the theme song for Orange is the New Black. Oh, she okay. That also. That's probably her fame. So I met her because I directed a workshop of a new musical that she and... Um, Randy McAnally, uh, they're both incredible country composers and performers and producers. They were writing, uh, it was the musical of the Hee Haw Show. And I just fell in love with her and her music. It's just gorgeous. And the first book, Rufus Wainwright, my dear friend Andy Goldberg introduced me to him and took me to see him in concert. And it's funny because I'm not somebody who would identify music being very important to them. I, I don't think yeah. of myself as that person. Like my husband every night listens to music for like an hour. I would never do that. He just lies on the sofa. Before going to sleep or to yeah, wind down like kind of. Part of his nighttime ritual. He just, like I will have music playing in the background while I'm doing other things maybe. Right. But I apprenticed with Wendy Wasserstein, the famous 
playwright when I was in my 20s for the last five years of her life. And her, one of her first plays was called Isn't It Romantic? And she always had a lot of music in her plays. So I thought, oh, there's, some, I don't know. So because the first one was named after a song, the second one is named after a song. And then um, what's funny about in, in these precious stones, music is also like, I, I've been working on this book for six years. And on this draft, I was like, oh, every character has music that is really important to them. That, And I didn't realize that either. That was also a total surprise. So, so interesting. Yeah, is that weird? It's more, pers- more important to you than you even knew. <laughs> yeah, totally. Or like there's this weird way where things can be important to your characters when they're not important to you or you think right. they're important to you and it reveals something. Yeah, absolutely. Those surprises I find are what is so great about writing fiction. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And making those discoveries, right? And are you still, so you're still actively um, a theater director, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you oh. know, we, we've had a hard time, we theater directors. <laughs> Uh, but thankfully, it's coming back up. And before, uh, a few years before the pandemic, I was running a theater in Ithaca as we were chatting. That the wonderful day right. from Ithaca, New York, um, is on this call. And so, and that's another thing that I'm thinking about doing is uh, thinking to myself: Is that something else that I have in me to be an artistic director again? And what is a moral and aesthetically responsible way to be making art in this country in this moment? Wow. That's a big question. <laughs> a I don't big, have the answer. Yeah, you, okay. <laughs> I was waiting for it. I was waiting. <laughs> no, I don't. Yeah, it, that is a huge question. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, does anyone have any, quest- any questions that you want to ask? You can just, maybe you can unmute yourself or maybe Michael could now unmute everybody. Yeah, or put it in the chat box. Or you can put it in the chat, or you can put something in the chat. I have more questions, but I just want to give people an opportunity. I'll ask, and I'll answer anything. It can be about the books. It doesn't have to be about the books. I'll answer anything. I'm so fascinated by your your wall still. I love the wall behind you and your your process. You know, I've been doing... some creativity. I, I started a company into the pandemic called Novel Readings, and I thought about them actually. I was like, what I should have done is gotten some actors to do the readings for my book today. Which oh, is that's sort of what my company does. We hire, oh. I work with writers and we hire actors, and they read works in progress to authors as a way of getting them to he- hear their own words in a different way. That's fascinating. Because um, that's one of the like key ways I feel like you hear what's wrong. And what's yeah. working, right? Is totally right back to you. Bye, Suzanne. Thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, totally. And you know, and I have a lot of you know, I could bore everybody with some of the research that I've done on cognitive, how we experience things cognitively diff, diff, differently from our eyes and our ears, and how long as a species we have been hearing stories, and how little as a species we have been reading mm-hmm. stories, and all of that stuff. But um, but one of the other things that I've been doing is sort of, I've been using, I developed this method of outlining novels using index cards. Uh, they're not post-its, they're index cards. It's very important, it's a huge distinction. <laughs> so uh, that's another thing that I've been doing for writers who just reach out to me and say, you know, do you have some time to work on me? I'm sort of stuck on something. And, and it's been really fun to, to sort of examine my own process and, to hone it. Okay, let's see. Did you see the chat? Please write a book about Arno after finding his own boyfriend after okay. kissing Ethan. James Cruz, I don't want to give anything away, <laughs> but he is the character who is in these precious stones. Right. So, so you have a different future in yes. the future. <laughs> and you and I are thinking about the same thing because he deserves better than I gave him. Diana says, tell us about the colored post-its. How much of the story do you map out before writing? Okay, I'll, I'll talk about my writing process. Yeah, I would love to hear that too. Sure. So this is what I do. This is how I've started doing it. I'll start when I have an idea um, about a book or a play. I carry index cards around and I start with white index cards. So I always have them with me wherever I am. I have an index cards and a Sharpie, and a Sharpie is also very important. A pen does not cut it. It has to be a Sharpie. <laughs> and I, every time I have any idea, 
literally any idea, I will just scribble it on an index card. And the rule is that you can only have one idea on an index card. Oh, card. Yeah. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. So if it's um, so like I um I have to, I have a I've been working with an intern in novel readings, Joe Roberto. Um, and so I've been sort of in exchange for him interning with novel readings, I've been sort of mentoring him through this process. And so I'll say, let's take a piece of fiction that you love. You know, we use The Boys, the Amazon series, which is complicated, but wonderful. And so anything you're working on, a character, a location, a line, a theme, an image, anything at all is, is a good idea at this process. And I will do that for months mm. and just keep them. I'll just keep them down. Yeah. Just like there is this play that I want to write that is sort of a version, a modern version of Antigone. Mm -hmm. And I've just been scribbling down little things, a plot twist, a reversal. I just, whatever the things are, you just scribble it down. I like that. And index cards are still great because you can shuffle them around. Yes. They don't buzz po I love post-it notes, but they stick. So that doesn't they're, work. They're too flimsy for this. They're <laughs> right. good for other things. They're too flimsy for this. Tell us about your OMG fans. In Brazil, I will. Rafael Asensio, my husband, says, I absolutely will. <laughs> um, and so, and then at a certain point, when I'm getting closer, the other thing that I like about this is that one of my terrors about writing was that I was like, what if I you know, write hundreds of pages of a book and then realize there's no book there? Right. And I've done that with 50 pages, but this is also a way I think of filtering out like, does an idea have weight? Mm -hmm. Right. Because, you know, um, I don't know what your process is like, but I feel like I'm like simultaneously, I'm always like, I have no ideas and I've got 40 ideas for the next book. And I go back and forth between those things. Is it? Right. Mm -hmm. So then if the cards are generating and they're happening, Tina, do you have a question that you want to ask? Somebody has a hand up. Oh yeah. Oops. Can we unmute? I'm loving. I'm loving your, your hearing about your process. So continue, and I can ask it later. Great. Thank you, love. Yeah. So then, if I feel like the index cards are flowing and the idea is happening and it's coming into focus and taking shape, then I'll start sitting down and scheduling times to do it. And I'll say, okay, from three to four on Tuesdays, I'm going to just force myself to generate cards. Okay. All of the cards. And at this point, you're not writing the book at all. I have not written a single word because oh. the hardest part of the process for me is staring at the blank screen. Yeah. So, and this is also, I took some wonderful TV writing classes with uh, writing um, script anatomy and during the pandemic, it's an LA based company. And their entire technique is basically outlining something so specifically that by the time you start writing it, it's it just writes itself. Now, I think this is possible in television because the episodes are 28 to 50 pages long. It's very different than a novel. Right. But the, the philosophy was still really helpful. So then I'll have a few hundred cards is a great place for me to be. And then I will just start looking at the cards and I'll just start categorizing them. And usually I find that the categories fall into character, plot points, locations and themes mm -hmm. and snippets of dialogue. Mm -hmm. and, and there are two other things that are really valuable that I find. The first is that certain cards unintentionally appear multiple times. Okay. And that's very important. Mm. And certain cards clearly have no place in this book. Mm -hmm. And that's also really important because mm -hmm. up until this moment, every idea is a good idea. And now you, you have sort of taken a curve and I'm starting to eliminate ideas. Right. And then I will put the cards up on my wall. And the way to do that is that I will take scotch tape and I will cut off a hundred pieces of scotch tape. And I will put each card up with a piece of mm -hmm. scotch tape. Okay. But then the good thing about it is that you can move it <laughs> so easily. Oh, that's great. 
So, and then I just start organizing and I try to create a story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the theater TV person in me says, what is the inciting incident? What is the climax? What is the reversal? What is the finale? I try to just have an idea of what those touchstones are. Right. My first book I wrote in chronological order. My second book, I did not. In the second book, because I had so much discovering to do about it, I wrote scenes that I knew were going to be in it. The, I see. the four or five most important scenes. And then the book emerged around them. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. And th these precious stones, because it is much more sophisticated formally, I also wrote in order. Although, okay. although interestingly, right now, the, the, the huge amount of work that I did before I'm trying to rewrite the fifth book in it is that I had five different versions of the first hundred pages. Oh, wow. And it was basically the same material in different sequences. Okay. And how did you decide which one to go with? I I've done that well, before too. I just called up the beta readers and mm -hmm. asked them, I was like, does this sound good? Does that sound good? Would you read this? Would you read that? Right. Because a lot of them complained about the first hundred pages. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. This yeah. system is fascinating. <laughs> I, I love hearing about it. And then I start writing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Uh, okay, well, so we, have, we have time for Tina's question. Tina, if you want to go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. Um, hi, Mike. <laughs> uh, Michael. Um, Michael's company novel readings helped me with, with a section of a uh, fantasy novel that I'm writing. And I'm on the lip right now of self-publishing and it's gone I've worked on it for six years and it's been through several editors and I just <laughs> they said okay send us your manuscript and we're going to send it to the I bought an editorial package is where eyes that work at Simon and Schuster are going to actually edit the thing and I thought, I want to send them the best part. And so I'm starting to reread the novel. And I thought, oh, my God, this would never have happened. She said, if this, if this had happened, she would never have gone on to do that delivery. She would have taken her directly home. So now I'm panicking. <laughs> oh, no. So that insight, I know that I can fix it. I know that I can get rid of that whole meeting. Mm -hmm. Although it serves a little purpose later, but not, I guess it's not really worth it more. My question is, when do, when do I stop doing this before <laughs> sending it off? Like, how, when are we done? I, I can only tell you, Tina, that as I was reading these sections from Hold My Hand, the words I was saying were not the words in the published book because as I was saying them, I was changing the Correcting words. them. Yep. Still working. Still <laughs> it never ends. That's encouraging. <laughs> oh my you. God, I'm glad. Encouraging and testing all at once. Yeah. Um, Tina is a wonderful writer, uh, novelist. Uh, and also we met on this beautiful musical that she wrote with our friend Elise uh, Edie Fourier. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that is great about theater is that there is an opening night. Oh, that's so fun. Yeah. Wow. Yep. I love that. Um, well, I hate so, to end this. Wait, oh, did you have oh, one? Okay. No, nope, that's good. That's good. You sure? I wish oh, we well, <laughs> <laughs> one last quick one. You have one more unanswerable question? The, yes, I do. The, the deal that I have made is I'm not going to get to talk to my editor. I will get to talk to liaisons in between. That's okay. Like that seems like ridiculous, but it's okay. Like it's, it could work still. And their I, point is that there are so many, you know, people, and this is really actually Simon and Schuster. And I don't know. I, I always thought you had to have like a real link with your editor. I think joy for my first two books and Trisha for this book. I think what's really important 
And you will know this, Tina, because you're such a talented writer and you're sensitive, is that the editor's feedback, you will know immediately if they understand the story you want to be telling and if yeah. the notes are helping you get from the story that you think you're telling to the story you want to be telling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then I don't think the rest of it matters so much, question mark? No, it doesn't. I, but I got 1,500 pages, uh, 1,500 words of sample editing, but it wasn't from that group of editors. It was from, from the uh, Archway editors, and I didn't like it at all. I thought they didn't read it. They don't know what it is. Yeah, so there right. it is. So, so you know. I, I will yeah. know. Laura, do you, have any, do you have any input on that? Um, I agree with you that you will know if, okay. the, yeah, the editorial feedback is, is just BS. Like you said, somebody hasn't really read it or just doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. And if they get it and they're trying to help you improve what you have and not trying to make you change it into something right. that you don't recognize. Yeah. It's not okay. the goal. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm so yeah. sorry I was late. Damn it. <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Um, we could do this for another hour. I mean, but, but we don't have to. But we don't have to. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming. Uh, it was wonderful to talk to you today. I'm so excited for your next book. So I will look for it in the winter of 2024. It sounds awesome. And um, yeah, thank you for your you for writing. Having, Laura. Thanks. It's so um, it's so helpful to be able to just speak things and so courteous of you and kind to invite me to the space. Of course, we're so happy that you came. And I just want to tell everyone that um, we'll be back in person. Actually, if you're in South Orange and on the call, we'll be in Yay. person on Monday, July 18th at five for another wonderful YA author, my friend Amelia Kahaney, who has a new novel called All the Best Liars. And she will be <laughs> speaking with that. us um, all about female friendships and mother-daughter relationships and all kinds of stuff. So, but thank you again. Thank you, Michael. Thank you everyone for coming. And thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye.